Hello and welcome to the Nutrition Diva Podcast. I'm your host, Monica Reinagel, and today we're talking about a rapidly growing sector of the food industry, insects as a source of protein for humans and, more recently, for pets. You know, we've been talking so much about protein in recent years, taking in more protein than is strictly necessary to meet your minimum biological needs has several potential advantages. It can help you manage your appetite and your weight. It can also help you hang on to your hard-won muscle mass and bone density and otherwise slow the aging process. And that's especially true with the higher quality protein that we get from animal sources. But there's a problem. A couple of problems, actually. First, the global population is growing faster than the food supply, and that means we may soon be struggling to produce enough food and enough protein to supply even the world's basic needs, much less higher protein diets. And secondly, a lot of people are growing increasingly uncomfortable with the environmental and the ethical aspects of raising animals for meat. It's interesting, the the percentage of people who identify as strict vegetarians or vegans hasn't really budged in several decades, but those who continue to eat meat are definitely eating less of it. We're eating about 10% less meat per capita than we were 10 years ago, and a third less than we were back in the 1970s. Now, I want to be very clear, it is not hard to meet your minimum protein needs on a plant-based diet. But if you were aiming a bit higher than just the minimum protein needs, it does get a bit more challenging. Plant-based protein sources tend to be less complete or balanced in terms of their amino acid makeup. So it takes more grams of plant protein to achieve the same effects as you'd get from animal protein. How much more? It would depend on exactly which proteins you were eating, but a ballpark estimate is that you need about 20% more plant protein. So 60 grams of plant protein might be the functional equivalent of 50 grams of animal protein. Also, if you're consuming your plant proteins from whole foods, as opposed to, say, protein powders, you're also going to have to consume a lot more calories to get the same amount of protein as you'd get from animal sources. And that's because the primary plant sources of protein, like legumes or nuts, also contain a fair amount of carbohydrates or fat along with that protein. So 30 grams of protein from chicken breast will entail about 175 calories. But getting 30 grams of protein from black beans will require you to eat 450 calories. And getting 30 grams of protein from peanut butter will take you about 750 calories. This is the concept of protein density that I talked about in episode number 483. Over the years, I've worked with a fair number of people who found themselves torn between conflicting values. They were watching calories to avoid weight gain in midlife, They also wanted to optimize their protein intake in order to hang on to lean muscle tissue, and they wanted to avoid consuming animal products due to ethical or environmental concerns. And to be honest with you, it's challenging to come up with a diet that is optimal in all of these domains, and it's virtually impossible without highly processed foods, which is another value that people are often guarding. And here's where bugs could potentially come into the picture. You know, back in 2013, almost 10 years ago, I wrote that in the not-too-distant future, nutrition-conscious consumers might be paying extra for flour fortified with protein-rich mealworms. And my prediction has come true. You can now buy crackers, energy bars, granola, and other foods that are pumped up with cricket or mealworm protein. You can even buy high-protein insect flour to make your own. So if you can get past the gross-out factor, it really makes a lot of sense. Insects are quite nutritious. They are humanely raised and harvested. They require very little water, fuel, land, or other resources to produce. And you know what? Our aversion to them is largely cultural. Various types of insects are an important food source, not to mention a delicacy, for close to a third of the world's citizens. And you know what? If you enjoy eating shrimp or crawfish, well, you're basically eating sea insects. 
insect farmers tout the quality of life that their quote unquote micro livestock enjoy. Insects are typically raised in climate controlled conditions that mimic their natural habitat, enjoying a diet of grains and fruits and vegetables. And when harvest time comes, the ambient temperature is gradually lowered, putting the bugs to sleep before they are then killed by freezing temperatures. So for those concerned about sustainability, environmental impact, and animal welfare, insects may be the ultimate solution. But how do they stack up nutritionally? Well, like other animal proteins, insect protein has a high biological value. The distribution of essential amino acids is similar to that of poultry, meat, and fish. And they also provide a lot of protein for the calories. Crickets are comparable to chicken in their protein density, but with the added benefit of being quite high in fiber. Mealworms, on the other hand, are higher in fat, and they have a protein density comparable to whole eggs, but with substantially more omega-3 fatty acids. Okay, but how do they taste? Well, true confession, although I have had things like granola or snack bars made with insect protein, I have not sampled whole bugs. However, I'm told that toasted crickets have a faint grassy taste and a texture like potato chips. <laughs> and mealworms are said to be a bit moister and chewier with a nutty, creamy flavor. While some intrepid consumers have already embraced toasted crickets as an alternative to potato chips, I see the insect-based flours and protein powders as the most likely route to widespread consumer acceptance. And if you're interested in experimenting, you can find insect flowers and products made with them at your local natural food store or online. We also have time today for some listener Q&A, and Anne-Marie wrote in with two questions relating to organic foods. I have heard that eating organic oatmeal is better because of the chemicals that are sprayed on oatmeal. Is this true? She wants to know. It is absolutely true that conventionally grown grains may be treated with pesticides that are not allowed to be used in organically grown grains. However, the FDA conducts widespread sampling of the food supply every year to test for pesticide residues. And these are not just random samples. The FDA is actually purposely going after those foods that they think are most likely to be in violation. So you may be reassured to know that 80% of all the grains tested had no detectable pesticide residues at all. And those that did were well within the limits that have been demonstrated to be safe. Furthermore, wheat products were the most likely to contain pesticide residues, and oat-based products were the least likely. Anne-Marie was also wondering about the so-called dirty dozen. You may have heard of these. These are the 12 fruits and vegetables that have the highest level of pesticide residues. How important is it to buy organic for the dirty dozen? She wants to know. It's not always an option for me, but I try to do it when I can. First, I want to just point out that just because the residues on these crops may be high relative to other crops, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are high in the absolute sense. In fact, the amount of pesticides that you'd be exposed to from eating nothing but the so-called dirty dozen fruits and vegetables would still be vanishingly small, far below the threshold of safety. So why would you ever pay extra for organic? Well, buying organic oatmeal or produce or other organic products may help reduce the total amount of pesticides that are used in agriculture. And that has obvious downstream benefits for soil and water quality and wildlife. But given the very low presence of pesticide residues on the finished product, I personally don't think that eating non-organic oatmeal or non-organic vegetables poses a direct risk to your health. In fact, I would say that avoiding fruits and vegetables because of pesticide concerns would pose a greater risk to your health and nutrition than any chemical traces that they might contain. Now, I could imagine some of you thinking, okay, but how can any level of exposure to a toxic substance be safe or acceptable? Why use pesticides at all? What would we lose if we didn't use them? Well, 
As I mentioned earlier, we are soon going to be straining to grow enough food to feed the expanding population. And pesticides generally enable food producers to grow more food on their land, resulting in greater food availability at a lower cost. However, I'm also really encouraged by new developments, such as CRISPR gene editing techniques, that are not only allowing farmers to grow more food, but they are also reducing their reliance on those chemical pesticides. I know there's been a lot of scaremongering in the popular press about industrial agriculture. And like any industry, there are certainly things that could be improved. But from my personal experience visiting lots of both conventional and organic growers, both at the very large and the very small scale, I actually think that conventional and organic agriculture practices are to some extent beginning to converge. After all, farmers, whether they're organic or not, have no interest in poisoning the land or their own families or their customers. And as better options emerge, I believe they will be very eager to adopt them. Thanks to Anne-Marie for these questions. If you have a nutrition question you'd like me to include in an upcoming episode, you can email me at nutrition at quickanddirtytips.com or leave me a message at 443-961-6206. I'd also like to invite you to check out my other podcast. It's called The Change Academy, where Brock Armstrong and I delve into what it takes to create sustainable, positive change in our mindset and our habits. You'll find it on all the major podcast platforms. For example, whatever app you're using to listen to me right now, you can just go up to the search bar and type in Change Academy. Nutrition Diva is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Nathan Sems with script editing by Adam Cecil. And thank you also to Morgan Christensen, Holly Hutchins, Davina Tomlin, and Cameron Lacey for their support. That's all for me this week. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.